we are here for software license and uh, licensing and compliance. It's all about community. Thank you all for attending and supporting Open Source 101. Uh, I'm Jason Hibbets from Red Hat, and I would just like to invite you to visit our booth before the end of the day uh, after the session uh, and check out our opensource.com community and how you can get involved. If you're not familiar with opensource.com, it's a community publication that accepts contributions from people like you. For example, you could write about a new technology or a new process that you learned today here at Open Source 101 and how you uh, plan to apply it to your work, your school, or your home. Our speaker today is a published author on opensource.com and a former member of our correspondent program. And now I'd like to introduce my good friend, Deb Nicholson, who will uh, share with you her deep expertise about software licensing and compliance. So Deb, take it away. Thank you so much, Jason. That was great. I'll just imagine thunderous applause or what's actually happening, which is the cat yawning in the background. Oh, well. Um, so, uh, I'm having a little bit of a sneaky problem working with the slides on um, while you all are on <laughs> and I can see your questions. So um, just uh, bear with me if I don't get to your questions right away. Um, so let's see here. Um, great. Um, Okay, so I'll, I'll check in um, periodically back to you all to see if there are questions in the chat. But basically, we're going to talk about uh, software licensing and compliance. I'm going to do, um, this is me, I work at the Conservancy, which is, uh, a, the Software Freedom Conservancy is a nonprofit organization that, amongst other things, provides expertise on licensing and, uh, and other governance topics for community-driven projects that we house at our fiscal umbrella. I'm not a lawyer, so this isn't legal advice. Uh, and uh, But I, am, I do know what I'm talking about, and hopefully um, you're not going to have a lawyer. You probably have heard that lawyers are expensive. Um, so you don't really want to have lawyers explain to you uh, the ins and outs of copyright law. So oh, we're still in the same... Mm. Uh, sorry about that. I'm going to just try and reshare because we still didn't get the slides. Great. So we're at this slide now. Um, is that working? Oh, okay. Good. They're moving. Great. Okay. Cool. Fun new technology learnings. Um, now I'm going to have to go back over. Okay. Anyway, so this is what we're going to cover today. Um, a legal history of class licenses, compliance, who does it, why do they do it, and how do they do it. And um, since we're an advocacy organization, a little bit of our opinions on uh, how they should do it. And then we'll do some best practices, tips, and resources. And I will leave some time for uh, questions so that folks can um dig into the parts that we didn't get into since we're gonna try and cover a lot of stuff here today. Um, so copyright law is, uh, well, it was originally designed for written stuff. Um, in Ireland sometime back in uh, AD 561, uh, there were two monks. One had like a book that the other one wanted and he asked like, could I please come over and copy this book from you? And the first monk said, nope, I like being the special person that has the only copy of this book. So he came over a month later to just visit and um, made a secret copy in the middle of the night. And so uh, the first monk found out about it and got mad at the second monk. And they had to get the king of Ireland to sort it out. And the king said, to every cow belongs her calf and therefore to every book belongs its copy. And so copyright was born. So uh, it was originally intended to be used for written materials. It was, um, it was always intended to be for like books and manuscripts and things like that. Uh, and so we, but we kept using it because law builds on other law. We seem to really dislike making new laws that are based on nothing. And so we sort of accrete law here. Um, so eventually, because you write music, uh, copyright also decided, we decided we would always have that apply there too. Um, anything written at all. So maps, scripts, plays, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, 
And copyright lasts for a really long time, especially when you consider how long it takes to write computer code and how long uh, it's useful for. Um, but we did decide that we would apply copyright to computer code because you write code. And so that means that it should go along with the other written things. At least that seemed to have been the thinking at the time. So licenses and software, um, when we, we did decide to have um, copyright effect uh, to be the, the first way that we would work with code. And then after that, we, we were like, oh, maybe we made a mistake and we should have put it in patents because it performs a function. So software code is interesting in that it's written, but it's kind of more like a set of directions. Uh, and directions like describe a function or a process. And that usually is what we use for patents. But patents also changed over time. They originally used to be only applied to physical devices, like a pin. So like this ball on the end of this pin uh, to keep it from poking a hole in your thumb. It's very clear that uh, either a pin has a ball on the end of it. So it's the patented you know, ball pin, or it doesn't have a ball on the end of it, and then it's not the patented ball pin. So patents used to be pretty clear and distinct and um, understandable. Eventually, we ascribed them also to pharmaceuticals. What's in those pills? Who knows? Could be anything. Could be a patented thing and not patented thing. We don't know. Uh, and then we had also decided that we would apply patents to business models. Um, on a computer. So then we had patents on software as well. So that that led to this huge boom in patenting all of the software. We patented all the things. Um, and we continued by doing um, uh, you know, more and more patenting, uh, including what we would call, sorry, where'd the page go? Um, Functional claiming. Functional claiming means that you have identified a problem and you um, plan to fix it on a computer. So uh, you could say like, hey, uh, I would like to sell stuff um, with a database and have it provide music for the person that is purchasing the things. Uh, you didn't have to provide source code. You didn't have to provide a picture of devices or computers or anything. You just had to say, I found a problem and I plan to solve it with software and you would get a patent. So some of the later licenses that we're going to talk about also included patents, which is sort of a mess. But they do all start with copyright. So we're going to go back to the beginning. The older licenses um, were all permissive licenses. Uh, so permissive means that's like the MIT license here. So permissive means that, um, hey, you can have this code. It usually has something that says, like, also don't sue me uh, or pretend to be me. Uh, it's, um, the don't sue me stuff, we just kind of say in the US about everything regardless. Um, and the don't pretend to be me is just covering your, you know what, um, you're not supposed to impersonate people anyway, regardless of what the license says. So the MIT license is pretty straightforward. It just says that, like, you know, uh, include this thing, don't sue us, don't pretend to be us. The BSD license, also fairly similar, functionally speaking. Uh, again, this is not legal advice. If you're going to make like a, you know, a $2 million business decision, you should probably ch like shave off a little of that and get an actual lawyer. But this is all good background for you to have. And then the Apache license, which is permissive, it's longer, so I didn't include it here, but it also includes a patent clause. So this is the first of a more modern permissive license that says like, hey, you can use our code, don't pretend to be us, don't sue us, but also don't sue us for patent infringement. And this was later after the big bonanza of patenting. Copyleft licenses, which are the most uh, important for the for compliance, because we're going to talk about compliance next. Compliance with the permissive licenses is fairly simple. It's you know you just follow the rules. Like, and most of the ways that you would enforce a permissive license are part of trademark law or are part of uh, fraud. So, um, so. When we talk about compliance with the licenses, we're usually talking about the specialized area of compliance with copyleft licenses. And copyleft licenses are sometimes known as share alike. Are people doing okay? They have any questions on this so far? Okay.
Obviously. You're doing great, Deb. You're doing great. Excellent. I'll just keep motoring through. I can't see the co the questions at the same time as the slides. So I'll keep an eye on it. So for Cheryl. You. Okay, great, great. Um, so share a lake. So like, say you give someone a book and then they uh, read it to someone else. That's basically all share a like is like you've shared something with them. They share it with the next person or cat as the case may be. And um, the licenses that are share alike for content and the licenses that are share alike for software are the same. It says, I've put this out into the world for everyone to use. If you use it and you redistribute it, uh, you must also put it under a share alike license. The part that gets a little tricky is when we start to talk about what is known as a derivative work. Oh, actually, we're going to talk about weak copy left, left and strong copy left next. So weak copy left um, means like that the share alike part only uh, applies to a small number of things that are like either you have edited the actual code that you were given and then redistributed a new copy or you have like written a library. And so um, the weak copy left stuff is just sort of like, it means like if you make a substantial change to the code that the person gave to you under a copy left license, then you have to also have that be copy left. But if you just write like an optional thing that goes with a weak copy left code base, then you don't have to share what you wrote. And this is strategic in places where uh, there is a proprietary competitor to the thing that you wrote. And you know that you both want your code to work with the same proprietary piece. You're trying to give people an open source option. So that's where folks tend to use the weak copy left. Uh, there have not been a lot of compliance actions around the weak copy left stuff. Strong copy left is where you tend to see more of the action. And that's... Um, these are the two main licenses. There are a couple others. There's a whole list of licenses at the Open Source Initiatives website, but these are the two main copyleft, strong copyleft licenses. And um, GPL, uh, well, there's version two and version three, uh, but GPL v2 uh, is the code uh, the code bases that are covered there that you've probably heard of are the Linux kernel, uh, the Git software. There's a ton of stuff in the Android stack. Uh, there's a uh, I think a, a number of different uh, web platforms and things that are also under GPLv2. So that's a pretty popular copyleft license. And um, the share alike provision there is what we would call strong. So that means if, uh, if you add something to a GPL, either version two or version three, or an AGPL licensed code base, you must provide the derivative work, like what you produce plus what the other pr person produced all together under a copyleft license. So um, compliance is when you do what the what the license has asked you to do. And so compliance sounds like it's it it sounds kind of harsh because I guess it's a, it's a legal term, right? Like compliance sounds um, you know it sounds like what you want your dog to do when you take them for a walk and it's time to go back in and you're pulling and the dog doesn't want to go and you want the dog to come back to the house. Um, but in this case, I, I think it's more helpful to think of compliance uh, like a proposal rather than a demand. So the, the proposal is, hey, if you want to use this code and participate in this community commons of software, then, you know, also follow along with the community norms. And the community norms are expressed through the licenses. Uh, that's just how it is because as we said, uh, software code ended up being put under default copyright law. So that means it has to be expressed legally. So what is a derivative work? If you have found this piece of code, don't worry, it won't bite. Um, and then you add another piece of code to it, like your piece of code plus the other piece of code is a derivative work. The piece of code plus 10 other pieces of code is also a derivative work. So the Linux kernel is a great example of this. Everything that works on top of and with and is uh, materially connected to the Linux kernel is all under the same license as the Linux kernel because of the way that the GPL v2 code base works. Now you can pull your piece back out and have them each under their own licenses, but once something has been published under a specific license, anyone can go back and take that version of the code and use it under the license that it was under. 
So um, software can be complicated. It's not always just a stack or a whole pile of, um, you know, equal parts. So take like a Reese's cup, like, you know, you have chocolate is separate and peanut butter is separate. And then together you have them in this cup form and that is a derivative work. So if peanut butter was copyleft licenses licensed, then the Reese's cup is now copyleft licensed. But it might be, you know, we've been making software for, I don't know, 30 years at least, maybe 40. Um, it gets more complicated. So what if you take that original piece and then you stick it into something else? So this is still a derivative work. This is a derivative work, even though there's it's just got a little Reese's cup over on the side. Uh, these are all derivative works right here. So you've got like now you've added ice cream, you add sauce, you know, whatever you want to put in there, sprinkles, whipped cream, the whole thing together, because one piece is copyleft, the whole thing is copyleft. So um, and, you know, and you can have it branded or not branded, but it doesn't change the fact that the code and the idea at the heart of it was still licensed the way it was originally licensed. So um, let me see, whoops. So, whoop, and that one for it, I don't know what's going on with the screen here today. Anyway, so complete and corresponding source. So once you have this whole uh, thing that you have created, like by taking different pieces of code bases, uh, from all over the world or all over the repository, and you have made them into one thing. One of the key facets of a copyleft license is that you must be able to provide what's called complete and corresponding source. So if you have uh, created this thing, you're the, you know, complete. And we'll get a little into what complete means in this uh, sense in a little bit. But it includes the dependencies. So you know, if even if you didn't write the peanut butter, you must provide the source code for the peanut butter. So that it is the current version that uh, you're using within your code base. Uh, and build instructions. You can't just, you know, um, it's like a recipe. You can't just have the ingredients out there unless you're doing Great British Baking Show and it's a technical challenge. Um, for software, you have to provide the build instructions when you are offering complete and corresponding source. So who does compliance to make sure that these rules are being followed? Uh, from a legal perspective, anyone with standing can do it. And there are a number of different ways to describe standing, but the legal, uh, the legal definition for standing usually means that you can't be a person that is completely unaffected and say like, hey, I just, you know, maybe you're like, I hate Microsoft and I just want to sue them because it would be fun or something. We don't hate them anymore. It's fine. But like if you did, uh, you would still need legal standing. You can't just sue people because they, you know, the idea of them bugs you. You have to have some sort of connection and you have to be affected by the thing that you're suing on. So for compliance work, you like most of the compliance work that gets done is by folks who hold the copyright on the code base that is not uh, that has been incorporated into somebody else's work, and then that person is not providing complete and corresponding source. So, Conservancy, where I work, we do compliance. Um, uh, we we had the code, we had the copyright on some code that VMware was shipping with within a you know a larger code base, and they were not providing complete and corresponding source. We wanted them to provide the complete and corresponding source. That case is done. Uh, they ended up not doing the complete and corresponding source, but instead taking that code out. Uh, the FSF does compliance. Um, I worked there uh, back in 2004 or so and uh, for a few years. And most of the compliance work we did then was sending polite notes because people didn't really understand compliance at all. It was uh, it was sort of made more sense that companies were like, I don't, what's compliance or what even is this? And even, I mean, just going back like 10 years, there were a lot of companies that were using copylefted code or open source code under various licenses and their legal department had no idea. Now we know that it is a mistake to have your legal department have no idea what's going on in engineering and we don't do that anymore. But at that time, it was a lot of education. Uh, the goal for compliance is an even playing field. So 
if you have written a code base and or some sort of functionality or some sort of library and you put it out into the world, you want everybody to have equal access to it. So if you say to everyone who receives your code that you want them to provide source for any derivative work that they provide to the public, then you want that to apply evenly to everyone. It's not fair if some folks come and take and don't give back or share back and others do. Um, so it creates this sort of disadvantage. Um, it's kind of like going to somebody else's birthday party and not bringing a present and eating all the cake. Not cool. Anyway, so uh, the other category of folks that do enforcement is um, folks who sort of provide a little bit of sort like code out there, often dual licensed. And they're like, you can either pay for it as proprietary code or you can take it under this copyleft code and then they try to sue them for compliance later because compliance is hard. Um, and we call that nuisance enforcement. It doesn't help the community. It doesn't make people want to use open source licenses. It doesn't make people want to use open source code. Um, so uh, I think I have more to say about them being vultures here, but I'll be nice and uh, the nuisance enforcement, don't do it. Um, the reason that we want to have compliance is that more access to the source helps everyone. The more people who can uh, access it, the more solutions we see, the more localizations, the more translations, the more um, optimizations of the code in different instances, different circumstances we see. And that's great. That's like the point. Many eyes shallow bugs. We also, the more times that code gets tried in different places, the more people who have access to it and can look at it, the more likely they are to um, solve some of the bugs by you know, pushing the parameters in different places and deploying it in different places. Hey, Deb, there's a question if you uh, could explain yeah. open core. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, so open core is, open core is when you have one piece of the code is open and then the rest is under a proprietary license. So that's, um, there's a couple different sort of riffs on that, but basically it's sort of, hey, come on in, the first one's free. And then then they try and sell you like the attachments and the accoutrements. Does that answer the question? I'll, uh, yes, okay, great. All right, so, um, so the other thing that's great about having the source code available for everyone is that it helps innovators compete. So if, uh, if you've got a huge, you know, like in an open core thing, like the platform is open, but all of the other pieces, like the current state of the art is like five years down the road and the rest of that source is not available. It's really hard to come in as a new innovator in that space. And so more source means that everybody can kind of start at everything that's already been written as opposed to like, cool, I have to pretend that it's 10 years ago and build my product from there. So source uh, also helps the competitive landscape. So um, when we do enforcement, we encourage, uh, and we encourage other folks to do enforcement, we encourage them to do it under what we call the community enforcement principles. And uh, this, I'm just gonna go through what those are. The first one is that contact should start privately. So you shouldn't, you know, I mean, this is good for any kind of call out. You should start with a call in, like, hey, it looks like you aren't complying with the license. Um, you know, and it's like kind of instead of like having it out there for everyone, give people the opportunity to be like, oh, I didn't really understand. Like, can you tell me more about complete and corresponding source and how to come into compliance? Uh, we also assume good intentions, not that people were, you know, uh, certainly, you know, that makes this maybe a little bit Pollyanna or whatever, but um you usually don't make a lot of progress with someone if you come over and you say like, hey, I noticed you're doing it wrong, but more like, hey, I noticed that you seem to be struggling with this. Can we help you come into compliance? And the goal is to get the source code. We, that's really what we want is the source code for all the reasons that I mentioned. It helps, um, it helps you solve more bugs. It helps the platform become more ubiquitous. It helps you uh, bring in more innovation. Uh, so the source is way better than any of the other, you know, the nuisance or the irritation or the 
side effect of like many conversations with lawyers. The source is always the main goal in community enforcement. Uh, and it doesn't prioritize financial gain. And so uh, again, like when we, what we want is the source because we want a robust free software commons of source code that everybody can access. Um, having someone pay like a speeding ticket doesn't really help us with that goal. Uh, and we'll, we at the Conservancy and other folks that adhere to community enforcement principles consider legal action as a last resort. Um, I did mention that lawyers are expensive. Two sets of dueling lawyers are even more expensive. So legal action is always considered to be a last resort. So you may be thinking like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. Like when should we start thinking about compliance on our code bases and our work that we put out? And the answer is the earlier, the better. Um, like super early, like way, like so, so early. Um, you wanna, because you wanna be able to keep track of your dependencies. And that means um, every time you're bringing stuff in, especially when you're like kind of getting up your, you know, your beta version, you're bringing in a lot of like little functionalities and libraries and things and, you know, pieces of like a main platform that your code base rests on. And you have different versions of those. And uh, maybe you changed them on the way in, maybe you didn't. The earlier you start thinking about compliance and understanding which version of which dependencies you've brought in and tracking it, the better off you're going to hey, be. Hey, Deb, we have a question. Uh, and yeah, uh, yeah, sure. What's what the question? What mechanisms are there to force or encourage code owners to adhere to these principles? So mechanisms, I mean, we have the entire legal system, but we hope that there's, you know, it's kind of the speak softly and carry a big stick that you would say like, hey, uh, obviously we would not like to go to court. We could, we have legal standing to do that, but we would prefer not to. So we would hope that those conversations when, it's, when you, you know, initiate with someone and say, hey, uh, it seems like you're having trouble coming into compliance and providing complete and corresponding source for this derivative work that you're putting out under a copyleft license. How can we help? So we try to a little more carrot. Um, but mechanistically, like, you know, at the end of the day, like, you can sue people for copyright infringement for not adhering to the additional rights and responsibilities that you've added to default copyright law. Does that answer that question? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for um, being my uh, question helper. Uh, okay, so dependencies from your hardware vendor. So even something like this tiny might now have code inside of it. Um, and if you're shipping a product that is largely all of your stuff in user land, but it has this device in it, and this device also has code, then, and you are providing, you know, you're, you're providing this all as one big, like, derivative work, you need to know what's in that uh, little device. So, and that's one of the kind of major challenges for uh, both for copyleft and the compliance kind of supply chain. Uh, as we are building tinier things and putting code inside them. Uh, but you have to do it. And the sooner you do start doing it and getting used to asking your hardware vendors for the source code, for the, you know, the little ICs and stuff that are part of your device, the easier it's gonna be. So when you are making a plan for compliance and, do, uh, and you know, making sure that you're doing things correctly, you want to have a lot of folks at the table. The open source programs office at a larger company can be the convener of this conversation. Um, but basically you want folks from business, you want folks from engineering, you want folks from marketing, and you want folks from community. Uh, this might seem sort of familiar because it's the same folks that you want in the room when you think about your overall open source strategy. You can't have business selling something um, you know, in one way that doesn't match your community engagement strategy. You can't have engineering uh, doing stuff and, you know, uh, and engaging like the community in a way that, you know, your marketing folks are una unaware of. You need to have this all matched up together. And of course, the legal department. If your legal department doesn't know that you're shipping uh, 
open source code, then they can't really be very effective. And you, you don't really want that. Because again, they're expensive. So you should work hard to make them effective. Um, you should also be talking to your upstream. So if, you, uh, if you're building something on top of like a large platform, like, um, you know, so say you provide something uh, that is like an add-on, uh, like a web piece or a web component to a, a large database. Uh, you should be talking with your upstream all the time so that you know what they're doing as far as compliance, you understand what their conversations about licensing are, and you understand uh, what their plans about licensing are. And that way you can work together with them on compliance. Stronger communities plus better and more secure code, like what's not to love, right? Um, so uh, everyone has their own strengths uh, and their pieces to the table, uh, kind of like the Scooby gang here. Uh, you want to make sure that your compliance stuff, you have an understanding on the engineering side of what constitutes compliance. You have a good understanding on you, you know, even your, um, the folks that buy your components. Uh, and that we'll understand what's happening and that like your marketing and sales and business folks also understand what the plan is so that it works with your overall engagement strategy. Oh. So uh, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to provide a couple of different links for resources and then I will take some more questions. Uh, but I'll just go through these first um, pretty quickly and I'll put the slides up later. So copyleft.org is a really great place to go and find resources on how copyleft licenses work, right in the name. Um, a number of other great places, opensource.org, licenses, and, uh, if you want to know about the GPL, you can go to GPL. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have a question, but your connection is getting a little bad, so I just, I didn't, I just didn't want anyone to have a bad experience with that. So, okay. I don't. I don't know if you can check on your connection, um, hmm. but maybe maybe drop your. Did you drop your video already? No. Okay. Well, maybe just give I'm it back? a second. Okay. Um, can folks it. hear me? Okay. It's just yeah. Our. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to you all from Cambridge, which is uh, one of the cities that has a monopoly. A service provider for internet. So um, we can complain and they can point to the 20 year contract the city made. No. Um, well, you're, you're back yeah. and you sound, you sound much better now. Thanks. Okay. Oh, well, they I heard might... me. They, they're like, she's going to yeah. diss us. Like, all right, pour on the internet. Um, I would just start the slide over so um, so people can didn't miss anything. Okay. So we have copyleft.org. That one's specifically about copyleft stuff. Um, we've got opensource.org, which is a list of uh, uh, all the recognized open source licenses that are, you know, major ones in use. If you wrote one tomorrow, they're not, it's not going to show up on there tomorrow. Uh, GPL FAQ, which is particularly about the GPL license. Uh, the Apache uh, site has specific license information about the Apache license. And uh, FSF.org, they have a family of licenses in addition to the GPL, the LGPL, the uh, AGPL and uh, both versions of the GPL, version two and version three. So um, I didn't know Jason was gonna intro this talk when I had this little plug here, but you can find some current writings and thoughts on the legal side of open source in opensource.com if you go to slash tag slash law. Uh, and there's like usually a pretty good roundup uh, each year, like 10 most important things that happen in the legal specter. The GPL enforcement, which I mentioned before on sfconsurgency.org, that's our website. And uh, here are ideas on how to be uh, more engaged and get uh, a little, like make compliance a little bit easier and get a little bit more soaked in on the current conversations around licenses and compliance. Um, so bring your lawyer to a FOSS event, uh, sign up for news uh, from Conservancy, from the Open Source Initiative, Apache, Debian, any other technical communities you work with. Uh, check out talks from folks who run programs offices. Uh, make some FOSS friends here online. Um, well, not IRL yet, but maybe next year. And uh, when you read that license, I would totally 
to the skepticism. There is a slight change that, um, let's see, really, really hard, and there is, uh, you know, like thousands and thousands of people waiting out there to sue you. Uh, it's not true. If someone tells you that there are thousands and thousands of people waiting out there to sue you, uh, you should expect the next thing is that they give you a card and tell you how they can help for money. So just, you know, three of that one. Um, these are my, uh, you know, uh, credits for the pictures and stuff. And then I would be happy to take questions. Oh, oops. Well, hey, Deb, yeah, you're... Uh... <laughs> Right when you were trying to give credit, the slides went out. So it looks like um, the platform yeah. automatically um, like detects. It's how... like you're done. Yeah. Okay. Well. So we have about five uh, minutes for questions. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks for uh, going through the uh, yeah the bad internets and the um, uh, the funny fun fun with new tools. Uh, but I uh, would be happy to take questions, and I'm looking at the chat now, so. Saying don't need me anymore, thanks. <laughs> um, I mean, I I need you in a, you know, in an emotional sense, but not in a, a, a functional sense, I guess. Thank you, by the way, for doing the um, questions um, as we went. No problem. Happy to help. Thank you. All right, Jason says, Jason Baker says, what advice would you have for someone who does not have standing and comes across a potential compliance violation? Like for example, a user. So uh, I would, uh, so it depends. You might have standing to ask for the source code. So if it's a device like a, you know, like a TiVo or BusyBox or a router or something that says like, you know, this contains GPL code, you can write and ask because you have been given uh, code that is under a copyleft license, which means that you have a right to the source code. So you can ask for that. Um, it would be hard for you probably to have standing for a lawsuit around that, but maybe one day. Um, I would also see if you could figure out what source code uh, it is that you want um, that you want access to and who is the holder, the copyright holder. And you may be able to join forces with that copyright holder and say, here was my experience and here's how I can add to, you know, your, uh, you know, your understanding of the state of compliance on the code that you produced in the device that you noticed the violation in. Does that answer your question, Jason? Yay. Any other questions? Oh, um, I'm just going to the backlog to see if we miss anything. At least we do not. Um, I know compliance is a big, dense topic. Um, uh, but yeah, it is. Uh, I, I I hope you at least don't have to go and have a lawyer explain to you how copyright law works now. So that's because they'll, they'll they'll definitely take your money for that. Deb, I I was going to talk earlier with Jim Salter, and he mentioned mm -hmm. um, like having a license for your open source project. Um, so I don't know if, if that's a topic you want to talk about for a moment and like how important it is to have to start with the license and, and those type of things. And then there's another mm -hmm. question too you can on the chat. Yeah, okay. So uh, I would say as much as possible, if you can pick a copyleft license, you should because it uh, adds to the uh, overall free software commons. Um, the next question in the chat is actually like, when is the AGPL uh, the most useful? And I would say that um, when you are creating a platform, uh, like AGPL is 
uh, you need to be creating kind of your own platform. So I, I also uh, help with a project called Media Goblin, and we use the AGPL for that. But that's because we built like a platform for hosting various media that is organized around the individual as opposed to being organized around the media type. So instead of having like your manifesto over here and your video here and your pictures here and your songs over here, you have the U site um, that is built for sharing. So it's its own platform, uh, and that's what you want. Um, if you're just building like a module for Drupal or, uh, or any, you know, or, or WordPress or Joomla or, or any number of other things, um, you don't want to put that under the AGPL because, um, they can't bring it back into the main code base because they have this entire ecosystem of code that, uh, is not ready to be switched to the AGPL. So they just won't take your code. Um, so if you're building something new from scratch, a platform that you think other people might want to build on, that's a great place to use the HTPL. Um, not for nuisance enforcement. And, and uh, I'm not, uh, that the whole conservancy is um, of one mind on that, that the nuisance enforcement, we were like, oh, you can have it for free under the AGPL, but then I'm going to try really hard to sue you in a month is like, we very much frowned on. Does that answer your question, Jamie? I'll go ahead and assume this. Okay, great. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, the AGPL didn't end up having the kind of, um, I'm not sure what the adoption uh, strategy was for the AGPL. I think one of the reasons that the GPL worked so well is that um, a lot of core tools like the Linux kernel and the, uh, you know, Git software was, uh, put under that and was there first. Um, and so things that got built on top of it were already built on top of like GPL code. So, uh, so think of ways to like maybe kind of mirror that um, experience as opposed to like, you, you can't just give somebody one little optional module. That's, that's not gonna drive adoption of a, of a new license. All right. Um, so I think we're out of time. Um, I'll hang out for like maybe two or three more minutes if people want to type anything or if you want to, um, I don't know if we have a direct message on here. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, you can also write to me, deb at sfconservancy.org if you have a question that you didn't want to ask in channel for the group. Again, I'm not a lawyer. You're not going to get secret free legal advice. But if you had a question that you thought of just a little bit later, or you just didn't want to ask in public, you can shoot me a note that way. Okay, thanks Jason.